Okay. Hi there, I'm Stan Stonlicker with Hub Culture, and we're in Bermuda at the Hub Culture Terrace Pavilion at the Global Fund Forum, really on the south side of the island where it's most beautiful overlooking the sea here. Joining me is Misha Petkovic, who is with B2M Capital, uh, a very interesting firm focused on investments in the medical space. So I'm really curious to hear uh, what you think is happening, uh, especially in biotech, around um, the investment landscape for for medical? Well, it's been a very vibrant industry sector, uh, Stan. Is that a code word for overinflated? Yeah, well, it could be. <laughs> it could be. You know, the, over the last three years, there have been over 200 initial public offerings. This is unheard of in any particular sector. In the last two years? Three years. Three years. Yeah, two and a half to three years. Yeah. I mean, that's a large, that's a suggests huge demand for this kind of product. There are a bunch of reasons for that. One of them is the fact that the biological sciences are progressing so rapidly, mm -hmm. and faster than ever before in the history of mankind. Yep. Uh, secondly, the addition of computing power to the, as a tool to decipher human biology uh, is, is accelerating the pace of development as well. Uh, thirdly, there's a recognition that when these products that are coming out of the space reach the market, there's a, a, an existing demand, particularly for those products that address uh, some critical unmet medical needs. And so I would say, yes, I would say generally speaking, you could say that we're in a little bit of a bubble in the biotech industry. Right. So what are the, um, what are the key things that are being tackled with these companies that are creating these big IPOs and generating all this cash? What are they, what are they researching? What are they working on? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, oncology, cancer is a big is a big area that many of the companies are focused on and are we going to fix cancer soon we're, we're making huge progress we're making huge progress uh, there are clinical trial results in some with some products that are showing in metastatic melanoma which is at, at a late stage is getting a 60 70 80 percent response rate this is unheard of historically um, so there's great progress in oncology there are many rare diseases that have never been uh, never been attempted to be cured in the past and we're making progress in some of those. Some how of much of it is DNA related, sequencing, and how much of it is data? Well, uh, and how I, much is just good old elbow grease? Uh, it, it's all data, and all and pretty, and genomics plays a big part of it for sure. There's no question about it. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, it, we're making progress because of all the developments that have taken place in the last 20 years in those fields. Who are the interesting data analytics healthcare plays? Well, you know, I don't really spend a lot of time in the data and analytics, so I'm not the best person to say that, but I think it, to rephrase your question and say it the following way, the, the a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach to uh, this field is going to be very important. You will see more and more uh, technology competent people in biotechnology companies who know how to handle data, know how to extract the important information from multiple different data sets to come up with a, a, an approach to create a product to address a certain condition. Okay, so let's, let's circle this back to V2M. So you're, uh, you're actively investing in these types of companies you're maybe a little worried that some of them are a little overinflated. How do you pick the, the winners? Well, it, it's, it's a multi-factorial uh, assessment, obviously. Uh, I, there are some obvious uh, requirements or criteria. Uh, management teams are important. Uh, I, am, I specifically am looking for products that address critical unmet medical needs. These are d conditions that are either debilitating or terminal. Are we talking about rich world diseases or are we talking about global diseases? Well, these are, you know, many diseases are global. So cancer exists all over the world. Uh, hepatitis C exists all over the world. Uh, many, you know, when you talk about um, uh, malaria, well, that's more restricted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not specifically looking at malaria. I'm looking at more uh, diseases that uh, address, that are uh, conditions that are found in more in more, in, in more parts of the world. Right, if you more in the industrial world. It, um, what about diabetes? Well, diabetes is a complex space. Okay, and the reason it's complex is because it's reasonably treated now. It's not well treated, but it's okay. And whatever drug you develop for diabetes is something you're going to take for your life. So the FDA has created a so very you high can't hurdle. So get rid of diabetes, but yes, we will. There are some strategies, particularly in um, in uh, either artificial uh, pancreas or or in using stem cells to create a new pancreas that will generate insulin. Okay, so, so let's jump on the stem cells for a second. So, what does stem cells look like? practically in the medical industry five years out? 
I think we will see them being used. I think we'll be see them being used in connective tissue. I think it's the potential to, to see them uh, being used in cardiology. Uh, I think in a limited sense, uh, it's not going to be huge at first. But if you look 20 years out, they will be a ubiquitous part of the treatment armament. So, we'll grow, so I can grow a new liver from drinking too much? Uh, yes, there's hope for you, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's, uh, let's switch over to, I want to ask you a little bit about um, a kind of out there thing. Uh, a lot of people in the technology world have been talking about singularity. And in the tech world, singularity basically means that around mid-century, uh, the, the flow of data will become so pervasive and so fast and so complete that we will effectively merge into a kind of single collective entity. It's very kind of sci-fi stuff, but a lot of people in the scientific and tech world think that we're heading toward that just based on the mathematics, on say Moore's Law and everything else. A big component of that, which should come earlier, is the idea of human augmentation. That humans, and certainly some humans who have access, will begin to augment both intelligence, physical performance, different things like that, which is really like this kind of next big Pandora's box for medicine. How realistic do you think that is? And if it is realistic, what are the, the timelines and consequences? Okay, uh, I do think it's realistic. It is going on right now, as you know. I mean, there are performance drugs that people use. They happen to have bad side effects, but they exist out there. So I think that that will definitely happen. There will be uh, strategies to enhance uh, uh, cognition, enhance memory. There's no question about it. Uh, the, the timeline, there, there are a couple issues here. There's the ethical issue and, and where we draw the line in mm -hmm. these things. And that is a debate that's going to take another 10 to 20 years. Uh, there is the... And we're not good at drawing lines as a society. Not generally. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, then there's a physiological issue. Mm -hmm. And that probably is a 20 to 40 year uh, uh, timeline. Uh, it's going to take time for these things to come to fruition. You know, when you're talking about human biology, we're talking about it, the most complex engine, the most complex entity being on the face of the planet. Okay, this is a complex system. It's all interrelated. And there are thousands and thousands of feedback loops and thousands and thousands of interactions. And without computing power, we can't even hope to understand How it. How much do we understand now? Oh, probably, I would say one-tenth of a percent. So we've got a long ways to we go. We've got a long ways to go. We, we, we don't even know what the microbiome does yet. And everybody talks about it as if we know everything about it. And everybody's got strategies to fix the microbiome when your gastrointestinal system goes awry. Mm -hmm. But we don't really know what we're doing. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know how it works. So the probiotic yogurts aren't going to be enough? <laughs> it's not enough. This is really taking the sledgehammer to the solution, to the nail here. Okay. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you, um, I, I love shiny new things. Um, what's your favorite shiny new thing that you've seen recently in, in your space? Uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that's most exciting to me uh, that's happening, it's a, I'm going to make a broad comment, it's a technology platform. It's been around for 30 years, but it failed every time before. In fact, it killed a person, in, uh, it killed a bubble boy back in the 90s, and that's gene therapy. It's finally coming to its time and place in medicine and it's going to revolutionize the treatment of a lot of diseases. Wow. And it's very, very exciting. It, you know, I, I, I've watched this space as it's developed and I've had no interest until the last couple of years and it's totally gonna transform things. Great, so the next big thing, gene therapy, already here. Misha, what a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much. Quite, um, quite V2M Capital, I'm sure that uh, I can think of a dozen people who would love to take you to lunch and, and really pick your brain about where this is going because it's something that really affects all of us. It does. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Stan Stonecker here in Bermuda at the Hub Culture Terrace Pavilion. Awesome. Okay.